Hello, everybody. This is Jan Kabili and Ron Clifford with The Photoshop Show, episode number 59. Tonight, our special guest is somebody who has been teaching Photoshop since, do you mind if I say this, Dave? No, since that's fine. Before the dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Is that true? <laughs> 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 Really, you were you were someone I remember. You know, before I knew anything about Photoshop, I would watch or I would list. Actually, I would read uh, what you had to say, and I would come to uh, Photoshop World and listen to you. And I was always in awe because you know so very much about Photoshop. So this is Mr. Dave Cross. Hey, everybody. Good Thanks to be here. Yeah. Well, Dave is going to share with us some of his amazing secrets, um, and he's going to do it in a way that you're going to be able to remember what he says. You know, because I think one of the real skills of a Photoshop teacher is that they put things in context. And Dave, you know how to do that. That's <laughs> what you're really good at, right? Well, certainly, I'd, I've never claimed to be the greatest artist, so sometimes my examples are deliberately fairly basic, so the concept is clear, and I'm not trying to wow anyone with my amazing artwork, because it clearly isn't. I ask people to use their vivid imaginations a whole lot to imagine this looks really good, <laughs> but the, the key point is how we get there and how you can continue to work on it over and over again. Very smart. Well, we'll be very interested to hear what you have to say, and I know you're going to talk about non-destructive editing in Photoshop, but it's at a level that I think most of you haven't heard yet. So um, we're really excited about that. But before we get to hear that wonderful stuff, I just wanted to say hi to um, our summer crew, which is kind of scarce, but wonderful as always. And that is composed of Dave Bell and Dave Bell. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Dave Bell. <laughs> Hello. It's good. Great to be back. Uh, it's been, we've been off for a little while, so it's, it's nice, to, nice to see your faces again. Though I did uh, summer? really had a great, well, I had a great time with Ron coming out to visit here in California, um, we got to spend some time shooting together in San Francisco, and uh, went up into the Napa Valley to the beautiful Castello di Amorosa, which is the lovely castle winery that we have, and uh, spent spent a whole day there and brought some models in and uh, to shoot. So just just had a grand time. So. Oh, it sounds great. Is it really nice there, Ron Clifford? As nice as he says. Oh. Yeah, it, it well at the castle. It, it's the most unbelievable thing I've seen in, in a long time. When I heard there was a, a castle winery built, I had kind of this imagination of a replica castle built with fake stone and kind of looking a little cheesy. Then that is not the case at all. The the gentleman that um, built this castle imported stone from Italy and real uh, tile floor and brought in real fresco painters and. Um, he built this around the shell of a, a, well, an earthquake-proof uh, kind of building. So some of the walls are literally as much as four feet thick, but the whole facade is authentic castle. It's unbelievable. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, you can correct me if I, I, I make an error on the math here, but there's over 100, I think 130,000 square feet of space, most of it being underground for the wineries and the barrels. Wow, and they're very generous about letting people shoot there, right? If you know the right people, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, it's nice to have some friends there too that uh, give us a chance to to look around. We've got some photographer friendly folks uh, there on staff. So, well, that yeah. sounds fun. I I really hope that I'll get to come out and visit with you in wonderful Napa Valley one of these days and see that place. That would be Absolutely. fun. Yeah. It, it's a memorable area. I, I took a trip out too and and uh, spent uh, some time shooting with Karen Hutton. Over in Truckee, we went to Lake Tahoe together and shot a beautiful sunset. Still haven't edited any of the images, but I have looked at them once. <laughs> but, um, Jan, you've got some fantastic news, a couple of pieces of fantastic news. For one, I happen to know that you've produced uh, or authored another amazing book. Uh, <laughs> and that's one thing. And then the second thing I'd love for you to tell me about is you're about to onboard some apprentices in the Arcanum. That's right. That's right. Well, I actually... so. We'll talk about the Arcanum in a minute. I was hoping to be among the first group of masters there, as Ron is, but I couldn't do it because I took on, you know, this commitment. Then I always honor these commitments, even though, as Dave knows, you know, they take up huge amounts of time writing books. Right, Dave? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, I took on a commitment to write this book, which I'm really, really proud. Can you see that? It's called the Adobe um, Lightroom and Photoshop for Photographers Classroom in a Book. And, and look at the bottom corner there. Look at that. 
My name is on it. I can't believe it. This is the coolest thing about it. Isn't it the nicest thing? Because normally they don't put your name on the classroom in the book, even though you toil to write them. But I guess they were happy, and so here we got that. And, um, you know, this book is near and dear to my heart because I am a big proponent of using both these programs together. I, you know, you always hear people say, well, I'm, I'm not going to bother with Lightroom. You know, I'm a Photoshop user. Or guys say, no, no, Photoshop is old school. I'm going with Lightroom. And I'm like, no, man, you got to go with both because they really are structurally different. They have different purposes. They have different audiences. They have different capabilities. And, and really to take full advantage of everything that the Adobe um, photo applications have to offer, you need to know both to some extent and importantly know how to use them together and that's the subject of this book really the the heart of it for me is how do you use them together you know do you just open something in Lightroom and then somehow magically it opens in Photoshop no there's a whole workflow that you can follow and it changes depending on whether you're using a raw photo or a JPEG or you've gone back and forth between the two programs several times so it's more complex than you might imagine but also very powerful so I'm very excited to have explained that in this book. Great. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. And the, Ar the Arcanum. Now, I, I, I was fortunate to be one of the initial six, they call them Inception Masters, and so I've been doing this for a little while, but you're about to take on a cohort of um, 20 apprentices, and um, that's a really exciting time. It's going to be busy for a few weeks, but then it levels out a bit. I, I think um, because we all love teaching here, Dave's a, Dave's a professor, and, and you two are, are Photoshop instructors, and I've I worked in teaching all my life. There's something about the heart of a teacher, you just can't not do it. I mean, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to pour in somehow. It's a, and then there's a, a great pay-it-forward reward that goes into pouring your heart into teaching. And I can't wait for that to, those, those rewards to come out of the Arcanum for you, Jan. Yeah, and you too, Ron. You're a great role model, and you do it so well. You know, this whole idea that Arcanum is a new way of teaching online that's kind of a, a mentorship program. You might yeah. call it that, but it's way more exciting because, you know, it's got all this fun and games. It's got the most amazing people as masters, including Mr. Dave Cross. Right, Dave? Are you going to yes. be doing this as well? Well, I'm, I'm on the, the list. I've been so busy recently that I haven't had as much time to put into it, but I'm definitely uh, one of the people on the list as a, as a master. So yeah. for sure. Great. I think you're going to really enjoy it. I know everyone who's done it that I know has loved it. And you know what it does is it makes it it kind of um, breaks down the barrier in my mind between teacher and student. It's not this one-way broadcast. It's a, a a journey together, learning and taking advantage of everybody's experience. Um, not only the teacher and the student, but all the other students or apprentices in the group in the cohort. So I'm really yeah. excited about it. Yeah. I think it's really I great how the apprentices. Uh, help each other as well, you know, getting together their own hangouts and uh, uh, looking at each other's work and, and it's really a, it is not just, yeah, like you say, a one way, uh, it's, it's a collaborative effort both ways. I think it's really exciting. So are you in a cohort, Dave Bell? Um, I'm, I'm along with, with Ron right now. Yeah, I was just going to mention that one of the, the great things about the model is that it's naturally inclined to bring up new masters because as you apprentice, as you learn, you level up to a point where you would probably like to take on your own cohort at some point, even to start to, to teach beginners uh, stuff. Maybe you've known for many, many years and you could share that knowledge and the Arcanum is a great platform for that. Uh, and and Dave, is, his intention is to level up through my cohort to uh, get to his uh, Sphere 1 level 20 so he can take on his own uh, cohort and teach them. Uh, in photography, so that's a the, I mean, just part of the exciting way it works is it's naturally inclined to raise up new masters within its own organization, and I love that that whole model. Well, that's really cool. And as people out there may know, or maybe they don't, the whole idea of the Arcanum is from uh, the Pied Piper of G Plus, which is Mr. Trey Ratcliffe, and you know he's just an amazing guy. He's one of the most inventive, charismatic. Um, kind and generous people that I've had the opportunity to meet through G+. And um, he came up with this idea, and I think it's just taken off. Um, so I'm really excited. So that's the Arcanum.com. If anybody's interested in joining, take a look um, there and see what it's all about. So, but tonight. <laughs> tonight we have something really amazing happening right here. And that is that Dave Cross is going to tell us some things about Photoshop that we probably don't know. Or we certainly 
may not have remembered that we know. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> Well, thank you. And one of the things that I I always uh, mention is that you know I do a lot of large room classes at things like Photoshop World and other things, and I often ask for a show of hands and ask how many people would say that they're mostly self-taught in Photoshop. And of course, generally, a very high percentage of people put their hand up. And I my standard comment is the only problem with being self-taught is the teacher. And when you think about it, it's like how how does one teach yourself something that you don't know about? So really what most people do in Photoshop is they poke around and try things and find a way that works. And the only problem with that is we all know there's always, as my mother uses, she uses the word umpteen as a measurement of lots. So there's always umpteen ways to do things in Photoshop and the challenge is how do you know? And unfortunately, yeah. and we were talking about this before I went on the air, Adobe has this philosophy now where they don't hardly ever take anything away. So they just keep adding more things. So now there's even more choices as to how to do things in Photoshop. So my philosophy very early on is, is I'm lazy, so I don't want to have to redo work. So I very quickly gravitated as soon as people started talking about this whole concept of working non-destructively. To me, that meant, oh, I don't have to start over again, or I can give myself opportunities. But one of the things that I found when I talk to lots of people is there seems to be this perception that when you say non-destructive it means the ability to undo and and that's one of the things but I had an interesting conversation with actually a, another Photoshop instructor colleague of mine at the time and he said well just to be devil's advocate I don't really bother working non-destructively in Photoshop because I'm doing work for myself so I therefore I never change my mind and I was like, okay, well, that's fair enough, but changing your mind is not the only thing. To me, working non-destructively also mean things like you can be more accurate, you can experiment more. I love the creative experimentation I can do when I work non-destructively, and I also find in many cases it helps me work more accurately and more quickly. And the other thing, and I'll, don't worry, Photoshop will actually appear. I won't just stand here and talk the whole time, but uh, just to set the stage, the other thing I talk to people all the time is I ask how many people have ever had this happen where you're playing around in Photoshop and you create something that you love and you save it and then six months later you open it and go how on earth did I do that? Yeah. Because right? at that moment in time it made perfect sense but when you look at it later on depending on the structure of your document you're kind of at a loss. So to me that's another huge benefit of working non-destructively if you structure your document the right way you can look back at it and reverse engineer and go oh right I used this filter and I did that mask and not only can you reverse engineer but you can even repurpose and say well gosh I could reuse that layer because I can just drag it into another document or I can use that same setting in an adjustment layer so to me it's become not just a a thought that maybe I should it's it drives every the way I work in Photoshop and the related products is I every single time without exception and I can honestly say at this point I can't remember the last time I felt like oh well I guess I'll have to live with that because I structure things in a way that that's never a problem I can always change my mind I can always experiment knowing I've got multiple levels of flexibility and I can go back months later and remind myself how I did things so that's kind of what I what I want to show is some of the reasons why working non-destructively is so important and also of course some some key um, methods to do that so you know, I can think Dave of two situations where that's happened to me very recently and this is really a bummer um, I used to size my images so they would fit on a typical you know web browser back in the day well now I've got the Mac Pro Retina where, <laughs> and all those photos look teeny weeny in the same right. Means I can't use any of my old examples, and yeah. I could. Uh, I'm guessing that we could fix that non-destructively um, using different cropping methods rather than um, resizing. And uh, another thing, there was another thing. Oh, uh, when we get new features in Photoshop, I realize that they're going to do a better job of things. An example that comes to mind is the wide-angle adaptive filter. Mm -hmm. which is a great way to straighten things up instead of you know the old ways of just sort of turning and rotating and using the straighten tool but if I baked my straighten tool changes in um, you know I would have foregone some of the wonderfulness I could accomplish several years later with the wide-angle adaptive filter. Right. One of the things that that frankly 
and I hate to say it worries me, but it does. I leave sleep. I lose sleep over this. No, I don't really. But it it concerns me that someone who's new to Photoshop that it's like you have to make the choice to be non-destructive rather than it happening by default. For example, I think smart filters are the best thing ever invented, but you have to choose to do that. Why aren't smart filters just naturally smart? Why is that a choice? You know, why, why doesn't it just work that way? Well, it's because that's the way it's always been, and Adobe's like, well, we don't want to change anything and make people freak out. So, But to me, it's like, why would you not want to do a smart filter? Just like, why would you not want to use an adjustment layer versus adjustments? But if you don't know they're there, you're going to go to the path of least resistance, which is a menu that goes, oh, look, levels, ah, curves, great. And all of a sudden, you don't realize you're being destructive in the way that you're doing things. Well, just so, in case uh, some people don't know what we're talking about, can you share your screen with us? And yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You're going to have to tell me how, because I'll talk about this for like nine hours unless you tell me to stop. So, <laughs> Ron will tell you. He's good. Yeah, we'll let you go for a while. Okay, so are we seeing Photoshop now? We are. Dave Cross. All right. There it is. So just in case anyone's interested, there's my little social media stuff. So here's the, oh, my wait, first... Can I stop you there and, and say yeah. something? I am so uh, embarrassed that I forgot to introduce you or have you introduce yourself. And there are some people who may not know who you are. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've done and what you're doing? <laughs> well, basically, the, the simple answer, as it says right on the screen there, is I've been teaching Photoshop since it came out in 1990. And that's really been my full-time job ever since then, either through my own, I had my own business in Canada, and I moved to Florida to work for Scott Kelby and his crew of adventurous people. And then about three and a half years ago, I decided to return to the entrepreneurial life. Um, ironically, about 114 yards away from the Kelby Group offices. <laughs> and uh, But that's basically what I do, is I've always made my living teaching Photoshop and related you know, other products in the Adobe suite. But basically, I'm a full-time Photoshop educator. I'm a passionate photographer, although I do it mostly to feed my Photoshop habit as opposed to anything else. So I like to take photos that I use in my Photoshop examples, but I don't ever intend to you know, make a living as a photographer. But I spend my time talking to Photoshop users and trying to f hear what their problems are and figure out ways to make their life simpler. And uh, I'm not a, a, a one to toot my own horn, but, but people in the know tell me I should always mention the fact that in 2009 I was inducted into this thing called the Photoshop Hall of Fame, which is a relatively small number of people as educators that have done that. So that was one of my proud accomplishments because for someone who does this as a living, it's nice to be recognized in that way, although I obviously don't do it for that. But that's kind of my thing. And like I said, I'm a big proponent of trying to do things in the most efficient, productive, effective, and creative ways in Photoshop. And you're so good at teaching it. I mean, there is a difference in my mind between knowing Photoshop and knowing how to teach Photoshop. And you really are terrific at it. And I always appreciate I catch you whenever I can on Creative Live. I've seen you there a few times recently. Um, where else, what, what, other, what other venues have you been at? Well, that's the main thing. I teach occasionally for Adobe, so I'll go to, like, photography, either clubs or, you know, chapters of PPA and things like that. And I have my own... Uh, workshop center in Tampa, Florida, though I don't do a lot of live events there as much. Um, but I travel around to basically whoever. I do corporate training. I speak at, at events like Imaging USA or basically whoever will have me. <laughs> whoever well, will give me a chance to, to spread the word. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, so show us. <laughs> All right, so here's uh, the first example. If I were to open a file that I'd done previously and all I saw was this, I would sob quietly to myself if I only saw the word background in the layers panel because that means that doesn't tell me anything. I, I, I can tell just by looking at it, clearly there's some layers going on, but how I did it, no clue. So saving a flat copy as a JPEG is great for whatever end result like putting it on Facebook or sending it to a lab for printing, but I hope like heck that I have the PSD version that I can look at and right away I can just by glancing at the layers panel I see smart filters and adjustment layers and type layers and things which means these are all things that I can edit. So I created this probably, oh I don't know, six or seven months ago 
And if I just glance at it, I really don't know exactly how I did it, but I can clearly determine that just by looking. Because when you look in the layers panel, for example, uh, let's look at this type layer that says dance. Well, I can tell that I did something with a mask there, because you can see there is a mask. This other layer called everywhere has something else going on because of that symbol. And we'll get into some of these things as we go. And then I see this one has smart filters, and I added some extra wall pixels there and and this symbol at the bottom means that this is a smart object so right away that gives me more opportunity to do all those things I talked about at the beginning I can reverse engineer and kind of figure out how I did and if I decide I love the look of this type so much that I want to use it in another document I can drag that into another document and reuse it and kind of repurpose it so that's kind of in a nutshell what what I want to focus on is this is why I think these methods are so important. Now, I happen today, tonight to be starting from Bridge, but it doesn't really matter. Um, for our purposes, it could be coming from uh, Lightroom or Bridge or just opening a JPEG or whatever it might be. So here's an example on the, the basic level, just to make so we're all on the same page, is why this is so important. So I've opened a document and my first inclination is I want to maybe brighten it up using something like levels. Well if you go to the image adjustment menu there's levels right in your face ready to be used but I know this would never ever happen but if I ever won a huge lottery and was able to take over Adobe I would either remove this menu or call it destructive adjustments brackets don't ever use these or something like that because <laughs> here's what happens you go to levels and I'll overdo it to make a point, you know, you, okay, let's go the other way, and we'll say, well, really over-adjust this because I'm not paying attention, and then I say, okay, looks good, click OK. As soon as you click OK, I've now altered those pixels. So unless I undo it, I'm in trouble. If I, for example, closed and saved this, and then thought later on, oh, gosh, that was a little bit much, let me go back to levels and try and fix it, as soon as you see a histogram that's all spread out like this, that means good luck. There's really not a lot of stuff I can do because I've already altered the pixels. So in this case, of course, I can actually undo, and instead I would use an adjustment layer. So I have a question before you mm -hmm. show that. Um, very, very often I have students who say, oh, I avoid the problem of wrecking the photo by making a copy of the background layer and right. leave them both in the image. What's your... Uh, well, and, and that's, a, that's better than working on the background, but here's the only problem with that. So let's say I did that and I duplicated the background layer and then use levels on that one. All it means is now I can throw this away and start again. I still can't tweak it and make it better. So it's it's one step better, but it still doesn't... First of all, I can't see what I did to it because the levels have already been applied, and, and secondly, I can't adjust it. So instead, if I go to levels... And by the way, I used to always duplicate my background layer because it was one of the only safeguards, but then I realized these other methods work just as well or better. So here's what happens when I choose the levels adjustment layer first of all if you remember when I did levels it appeared right on top of my photograph and covered up half of the thing this adjustment layer ends up in this properties panel so it takes gives me all my image to work on and I can make my adjustment but there's a significant difference here and the simplest way to say it is there's one important thing missing from this panel and that's an OK button when you use adjustment layers, you never actually click OK, you just leave it. And the way you leave it means from now on, that's the way it looks until I go back and change it. So because I don't have to click OK, I can collapse this if I want, but you'll notice the background layer is untouched. I'm making it look this way through the adjustment layer. And in this case, if I save it, as long as I save it in a layered format, then the next time I come back, I can look at it and go, wow, that was a bad choice. But this time you can see those little triangles are right where I left them, so now I can make better choices. So that's and one of the first... Uh, Dave, just in case people don't know, and I know we take this for granted, layered formats include three kinds of files, which are... Well, I'll tell you, the simple answer for me, and, and, and although there are technically other choices, for me, I only think of PSD as a Photoshop file, and, and I'll tell you why. If 
because you can also save it in TIFF and you know the, there's several formats but my worry is this if I look in a folder and I see a file that says something dot TIFF it could have layers but it might not I don't really know whereas to me if I look on my hard drive and I see a file that says dot PSD I know the only reason I would save it in PSD would be to include layers so for me I always use PSD as the layered format of choice only because at a quick glance and it's just it's a it's a silly reason but it's my reason that, that I make my life simpler because I never in the past I used to have to open a file and go wait is this the one with layers whereas if I look in a folder and I see you know my raw file and then .psd I know that's my what I call master file that has layers and whatever smart filters and all those other things and also I use some Photoshop specific things that mean I want to make sure I preserve all of those. So throughout this whole thing, everything I'm going to be showing you does mean this will only work effectively if you save it in one of those layered formats. And again, my format of choice is the PSD file. So the fact that I didn't have to click OK means built into this file is this levels adjustment layer and I can tweak it. So that's sort of point number one of why we use this method. But here's another thing that that I love about adjustment layers is the fact that they are so temporary means I can deliberately overdo things to make my life easier. So here's an example. I've got this red covered bridge and I decide I want to change the color of red slightly, just a little bit. So if I did an adjustment layer like hue saturation, I might only want to actually change the hue a little bit and then mask it. But the problem is, or the challenge, is if you only make a subtle change, it's really hard to see what you're doing. And I see people do this all the time where they like move the saturation just a little bit and then try and spend all their time masking to see if it worked or not. Well, my philosophy is that's, that's working too hard. Why not make the bridge like fluorescent green? and then down in the layer mask I'm gonna invert it to hide it so that means the layer mask is black so therefore I have an adjustment layer that's been applied but currently is hidden now I can take my paintbrush as an example and as I start painting now it's painfully obvious to me if I make a mistake if I go too far I can clearly see because instead of trying to make a subtle little change in the color red I'm making a huge change because for the moment it's green. It's not going to stay green but see down here for example in the water it's so much easier for me to tell oops I went a little too far so I can just swap the colors and a layer mask painting with black will hide the effects so I can just come in here and obviously I would get even closer and do it more accurately but for the purpose of time. So in this way you can see now it's taken me hardly any time at all to make sure that I've got all the areas I want masked once I'm happy with the mask, even though it looks like this weird fluorescent green, that's okay because now I can just go back to the adjustment layer. If I double click on the names, hue, and saturation, it puts everything back to zero. Now I can make my subtle little change that I want. And if I turn that on and off, you can see, you can barely see the difference. Imagine how hard that would have been to mask that if I was doing two slightly different shades of red. So even though I want to end up with that subtle change, I take advantage of the fact that adjustment layers are temporary, so I can therefore temporarily, quote unquote, wreck my photograph to make it easier to see what I'm doing. Oh, that's they, all. That, sorry, I was just going to say that that very technique is something that I, I uh, um, often, almost every time, teach also in Lightroom because you can bring your sliders back is to right, exactly. really overdo it put in your effect and then bring it back to where you want it. It makes it so much easier. It really does and one of my favorite expressions when I teach Photoshop is we should always be thinking about what we want to end up with because I want to end up with a subtle change doesn't mean I have to start with a subtle change and that's a philosophy of mine that has served me very well and I, I wish there was a way to quantify how much time I've saved by using this type of method and this can be used for so many different things you know like trying to play with the shadows a little bit and, and make them a hair darker will make them a whole lot darker so you can see what you're doing and then pull it back as long as you're using adjustment layers everything you do has that ability for you to change your mind and and 
take that as an advantage. Another example of that, and I don't have one right in front of me, but I had a case many years ago where someone sent me a photograph and said in the uh, email it said, can you just, and I love when people put the word just in their Photoshop request, can you just extract this person from the photo? And I was like, oh, okay, that should be pretty easy. And then I opened it, and it was a, a dentist. It was a white-haired man wearing a white lab coat standing against a white wall, and it was quite overexposed. Oh, so it was, like, impossible to see where his lab coat ended and the wall began. And I'm like, how can you select something when you can't even see it? So I took an adjustment layer, and I made it ridiculously dark to the point where it wrecked the photograph, but now I could see the edge of his coat, and more importantly, so could the Photoshop selection tool I was using. So that's another example of take advantage of the temporary nature by saying, you know, I want to end up with this result, so I'll make my life easier by doing something temporarily. And that's the kind of, you know, and, and a suggestion of a way to work that's always going to give you the ability to try things a lot more than normal. So... Here's a, another example of, of this, the same kind of idea. So let's say in this photograph I want to do kind of a vignette effect, the burnt-in edges, whatever you like to call it. This is the what I now call the old-school way I used to do it, which was to add a new layer, fill it with black, take my selection tool, and then use this command called feather, which is to me one of the most evil things because... It always cracks me up when people stare at the feather amount like they know it should be 80 versus 70 versus 60 because no one really knows. It's a total guess. And more importantly, there's that OK button again where I have to just so go with it and go, well, I guess that's all right. And then I hit delete, and I've got this burnt edge, which is kind of like, well, if there's something I don't like about it, I pretty much have to start over or undo multiple times and tweak it. So there's not much about this that's very flexible, nor is it very reusable. So instead, I would use a command like curves, and even if you've never used curves before, it's pretty easy to just say, well, if I drag this edge down, it's going to get darker and darker, and if I pull far enough down, it looks like it's now black. And there's a reason I'm doing this as opposed to just saying fill with black. Mm -hmm. So because this is an adjustment layer, again, I didn't have to click OK, and that's key to this working and every adjustment layer by default has a mask on it. So in this case, I take my marquee selection tool, and this is the only part that's a little mind-boggling at first when, if you're not that familiar with this, because when you paint on a mask with black, it hides the effect. So in this case, in order to make the middle part not black, I have to fill the layer mask with black, <laughs> which is like, wait a minute, what? But that's because if you look at the way it's working, the black area is not being affected by the curves adjustment. So that's why at the moment, just the outer area has that black look to it. So that's okay, but, but what about that feather thing? Well, that other method of feathering has an okay button. This is a much better option. This is one of my favorite things that came into Photoshop a few versions ago was this properties mask panel where now I have feather on a slider so I can just move it around and go, that looks good there, and it happens to be 119.2. Once again, I don't click OK. So at this point, every aspect of this effect is editable. I can go back now to the curve and say, well, maybe I don't want it black. Maybe I just want a darker version of the original photograph. And now that I've done that, maybe the feather is too much or not enough. And... I'm going to overdo it so you can see it. And even then, if I decide, well, I kind of cut off the top of the bridge, this black rectangle is just a shape. So if I hit Command or Control-T for free transform, I can transform the mask shape the way I want to position it, hit Enter, and then it reapplies everything. So every single aspect of it is editable. And part of the reason that I always also suggest this is I'm sure many people who are watching have had this issue well, I'm guessing they have at least, and that is that on occasion when you print, it doesn't look the same as it does on your screen. So here's one way to play with that is now if I print this and go, whoa, those edges are way too black, I know I can go back to my curves adjustment layer and tweak it, or I could even lower the opacity. I have all these different options that I could use this for. And that's not all. I could now say, and I like that effect so much, I could say, well, I have 
another photograph that I'd like to use that same effect. So instead of starting again, I just drag and drop it onto the other photograph. Now, the settings aren't right because it's a different style photograph, but that's fine because once again I can come in and tweak the feather or adjust the box. But again, instead of starting fresh, I'm just repurposing and then tweaking. So it's in a sense, although it isn't really, it's almost like when you create a preset in programs that you have presets where you can click something and it's applied and you can tweak to get it to look the way you want. This is kind of the same thing. So you it could totally imagine. Makes like, sense. It totally makes sense. You know what there, Dave? Here's one thing as I watch you do this, I'm thinking, you know where these things are. But we just saw you go to curves, we saw you go to the properties panel, and we saw you go to transform. And I wonder if like the average Photoshop user would know they could do all that wonderful non-destructive stuff. You know, they have to go to so many places. Remember well, and, and the and the challenge I think is, as I said, is right from the get-go. They, Adobe makes the other methods more as a, one of Adobe's favorite terms is discoverable so those other terms are more discoverable so there's no question that at first when you add an adjustment layer you have to kind of go okay so the adjustment is in the properties but if you look at the very top of it the properties panel covers two things because an adjustment layer always has a mask you can either look at the adjustment layer or the mask so both of those things are available to you. So you're right. I mean, it's it's not obvious, um, but that's why I show these things so that people can say, oh, well, now that I know that's there, gosh, that's such a simpler method. In fact, I sh showed this to a, a student once who came for some training, and they came back for a follow-up about a month later, and they very proudly showed me this Photoshop document they created, and the only purpose of it was to have five different styles of adjustments that they would drag and drop into other documents. So it was kind of like a holding place for these looks that they created. Instead of trying to remember how they did it, they just would drag it over and then tweak the results if necessary. Ooh, good idea. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting way to take advantage because that is part of the idea of this whole kind of, you know, repurposing thing is, is that ability to say, well, I've already done the work somewhere else, let me just pull it over and and apply it to something else. Um, so now just to, to switch gears a little bit, part of the, the work non-destructively concept obviously revolves around layers. So very often we're going to end up with a number of different layers. <coughs> Excuse me. And I personally find that whenever I've got layers in a document, I often want to try different combinations where I want to say, for example, with these all these photos, without these photos, maybe one of them black and white or the background black and white. And I ended up in the past, I would end up with like, you know, five different copies of the documents called layout one, layout two, layout three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the problem was you'd come back a month later and go, I have no idea what the difference is between all these different documents. You end up opening them all and trying to figure out what you did. So now I don't do that anymore, and thanks to a function that's actually been around in Photoshop for quite a while, but I think it's probably one of the lesser known and therefore less used functions, and it's called layer comps. And this is a wonderful way, and I'll show you first with this example, and then we'll show you even a, a more basic example for people that don't use this kind of multi-layered thing. But let's assume for a moment that I'm creating, say, an album page for this couple, um, by the way, this was a workshop that I went to with uh, Kenny, Kim, and Ray Santana, and it was like the most ridiculously gorgeous people ever in the world, like I'd ever shoot a wedding like this, so it was an, a nice opportunity for me to get some nice photos to, to use in tutorials like this. Um, but I want to give them some options, so I, I would say, okay, so here's the first option, and then I say, now the other option is would be to not have that floral thing, and then this photo could be down here, and we could not show this photo and then I'm doing this let's use our imagination with these people watching over my shoulder so I show them this option and then they say okay that's kinda cool could you show me the first one again and it's like okay that was this one was showing and this one was up here somewhere and the flower was on and they're like okay go back to the other one and it's like oh. You know, you can imagine very quickly how that would become tiresome. So instead, what I do is use this thing called layer comps. Now, I have mine already attached here, 
If you don't see it, you just have to go to the window menu and find layer comps. And what layer comps are, or is, is a, a method where you can, in effect, record the current state of your layers panel. What layers are visible, where they're located, things like opacity and, and layer style and things of that nature. So I'm going to just click on this new button and as we probably know in Adobe the turning page icon always represents new whatever it is. So in this case new layer comp and I would call this something and I'm telling it that I want to show to include the visibility of the layers, their position and this appearance. Now this is a little misleading because it says brackets layer style and I think I know personally I used to think of layer style as drop shadow, bevel and emboss, you know, things like that. But interestingly, in the layer style panel, it also applies to opacity, blend modes, and a lot of other things. So it, it's a lot more than just simply things like drop shadows, as we'll see. And there's a place where you can put comments if you want to remind yourself. But for now, I'll just say, okay, that's so that's the first one. Then I want to hide this layer take this layer and drag it down here and hide this layer. So then we'll go back to the layer comps and make another new one and call it um, just two and I might make some comment like no floral thingy. These are comments just for me. I wouldn't show these to my clients of course. And then we want another one where maybe this photo is over here and we want the floral thing but at a lower opacity so it's just a little more invisible and I once again click the layers panel and say two photos on left I like to make names of my layer comps very obvious uh, 40% click OK now you can imagine I could keep doing this let's do one more where I say on the background layer I want it to be uh, have a black and white look so I'll make one more and call it black white background and you could of course make as many of these as you want but the beauty of this now is now when I want to show someone this instead of me having to go hide hide show move adjust adjust all I'm doing is going to layers panel and saying here's the first option here's the second option, here's the third option, here's the fourth option. And I can of course jump specifically to each one. I can also use these little arrow keys to go through. But some of you, most of you are probably watching the image. This time watch the layers panel and you can see as I'm doing this it's automatically turning layers on and off and changing the opacity and everything else. And so this, the, doesn't, this doesn't make a double file size, right? This is just... No, that's that's the other beauty of it, is a layer comp is just an instruction, in effect, that says, here's a snapshot you took at, of this current state. Well, so you could, you could have 15 of these and your file size would not get any bigger. Now there is a slight, I want, don't want to call it a catch, but it is something you have to be aware of. Layer comps will record the visibility and the position and the appearance but not the content. In other words, if I wanted to have some text on here and I wanted to have one that was in you know, Helvetica and one that was in some other font, I'd have to make two different type layers. So in other words, you can't add a type layer, make a layer comp and then change the content like to a different font because that's going to change across the whole thing. That's why I had to use an adjustment layer here instead of just converting this layer to black and white because if I convert it to black and white on every layer comp it would be black and white. So yeah. by the same token if you wanted to put a logo and have a big and a small one you'd have to add two logos one big one small. But once you get past that that's kind of the, the one thing that's kind of makes people kind of go mm, wait a minute uh, it's a huge benefit to me because it means now and here's the other thing going back to that uh, reverse engineering if I save this PSD file with the layer comps I can come back to it six months from now and go what did I do again and it's gonna tell me because I'm just gonna look at through these options and it will walk me through them and move things and and turn layers on and off so I love this as a way of experimenting and again it doesn't have to be something as complicated as you know multiple layers it could just be I want to see what this document would look like if it was either done with a black and white 
or with a gradient map or so you create like two or three different options for adjustment layers and then make layer comps with different combinations of them so when you want to kind of quickly compare which one of these gives me the looks that I want instead of clicking on on and off layers you could make layer comps that are you know only black and white black and white plus gradient black and white gradient 50 percent whatever you know combinations um, unfortunately you cannot repurpose the layer comps into a different document but at least you can look at how you did it and then you could for example drag the adjustment layers over or whatever I personally use it a lot for this kind of thing when I'm just experimenting I know a lot of web designers mock up um, websites in Photoshop this is a fantastic way to do it because in one document you can have all your pages just as different layer comps so you can have the consistency of certain elements and keep those throughout and then just turn other layers on or off and this is one of these functions where like I said it's it's not very well known most of the time when I show it people are like so is this new in Photoshop CC I'm like no it's been around since like Photoshop 5 not CS5 <laughs> it's been around a long time but it's just not obvious I mean if you think about it if you didn't know what it did and you went to a dialog box that looked like this last document state and you're like okay it really doesn't give you any hint as to the power of what you can do with this. So, okay, so what does last document state mean when you have your layer comps panels filled Well, out? what all that means is, because I haven't made a layer comp, it means at the moment this is the state of my document. So it just means as soon as I go to add a new layer comp, then now that's the state. If I turn it off, you see how it's saying, well, unless you make a new layer comp, the last I don't know why it's called last document state. It probably should say current document state, but anyway, that's that's what it really means. Is it means if you're in the middle of changing things, you don't want to change the current layer comp. It's just saying at the moment this is the state of your document. Typically, what people do, I think, is they make a layer comp, make some changes, and make another layer comp so that this last document state really doesn't come into play all that much. Um, but it's just it's just a, a, a an option that's available as a way to try lots of different things and it can be as simple or as complicated as you want. I've done you know layouts for like DVD covers that that had an outside and inside and a, different versions and it was just one document whereas in the past like I said I would have in the previously had version A, version B, version C, version D and trying to figure out which one was which. Now I'm doing everything right here just just built into the document. And if on top of that, you're oh, wait, also wait, using. Don't go. Don't go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, with, go within layer comps, if you're still using you know, adjustment layers and smart filters and all those things, that still means your document itself is already non destructive, and now you're just building on that and making it even better by using layer comps to kind of manage it. Absolutely. This I see is one of the things. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> no, you go ahead, Ron. I said, this is one of the things that, that really uh, kind of opens my eyes because um, I like to start my workflow within Lightroom and I use um, virtual copies and snapshots and um, because Lightroom doesn't really work with text layers and the different graphics things it's really a very powerful thing in Lightroom but I didn't realize until tonight that this is an option for us in Photoshop as well. Mm -hmm. so this and is, it's, this it's is really a, interesting actually because a lot of people I think in the past I used to spend a lot of time in this thing called the history panel. Mm -hmm. Now I can't honestly remember the last time I opened it except to show people why I don't use it anymore. Because the history panel, you can create snapshots and, and what used to be a method that people, well, I think some people still do. But the problem with the history panel is it's, I always call it today's history. Once you close this document, there ain't no history anymore. So if you want to come back tomorrow, there's no snapshots, there's no history, there's nothing for you to work on. That's why layers and, a, and layer comps to me is a much better choice because this way I have an ongoing ability to change my mind. I need to ask you another question about mm -hmm. layer comps if we could. Sure. I heard that there are some changes to the layer comps panel in Photoshop CC 2014 which you right. have there. Can Are you prepared to tell us what they are? Well, uh, okay, I, if not. I can. It's just a, it's a little more complicated because it also incorporates smart objects mm. and you have to sort of do smart yeah. objects and layer comps together which may or may not be uh, an option for tonight. <laughs> right. it's, it's a little more complicated but it, it's very, I was like 
it was funny because Adobe did like a, a little event where they showed a bunch of us some new things and he showed this layer comp thing and I was like, yes! And everyone else was like, what? <laughs> and I was the only one that was excited and they were like, this is for you, Dave. I'm like, all right. Because I was like, yes, finally some, because layer comps have been around for a long time but they really haven't changed anything in a long, long time. So now Lightroom is a little bit different but here's uh, an example of the way I like to use Camera Raw and you could do a similar thing with Lightroom, which I'll talk about in a second. Normally, when you open a RAW file in the Photoshop uh, workflow, you, of course, it opens in Camera Raw. And by default, it works like this. I'm going to deliberately do something bad. And so I make an adjustment, and I hit Open Image, and then it applies those settings, and it opens in Photoshop as a typical background layer that no longer has any connection to Camera Raw, except for the fact that it started there, but that's it. There's no going back, there's no, oops, I made a mistake, because it just says background. So it's like a one-way, dead-end street. Now, there is a way to change that, and it's about as non-obvious as something could possibly be. <laughs> this is another example of, I always kind of chuckle when I hear someone at Adobe saying, we're trying to make this more discoverable. I'm like, well, you failed miserably in this case because <laughs> one of the most important options in Camera Raw is called workflow options. Now, does anyone see a button or a menu item that says workflow options? Mm -hmm. No. There's a what looks like a text hyperlink down at the bottom when you click on it, oh look, workflow options. I, could you make that be less <laughs> obvious? This is such an important thing to get to and a lot of people who use Camera Raw go, wait, there, what? Workflow options? So I can do things in here like change the color space and resize to fit, but for our purposes, the most important thing is this little checkbox that says open in Photoshop as smart objects. And the fact that it's plural is Adobe's subtle way of saying from now on, as a preference, always open in every raw file as a smart object. That's why, it. because when I first read it, I was like, how can you open one document as objects? But that's their way of saying, like, it's a preference. So I make, again, some bad adjustment, but now the button says open object. Just that simple change means now it opens in Photoshop, but now it no longer says background. It has, I don't know, does that zoom in thing? I'm sharing my screen. Um, uh, can, no, one zoom in, but we can see it. You can see this little symbol on the corner, which tells me it's this thing called a smart object. That means I can do Photoshop-y kind of things like, you know, let's just scale it down and rotate it and do all that, and then I suddenly realize it's a little dark. Maybe I should have adjusted it differently. Well, in the previous example, it was that dead-end street. Now the fact that it has this smart object symbol means you always have the ability to edit the contents of the smart object. Well, in this case, the contents resides in Camera Raw. So I've just created a two-way street, so now I can make whatever adjustment I want in terms of whatever, click OK, it will reapply that but preserve whatever else I've done in Photoshop. So this means that for example, if I'm trying to do subtle adjustments that start in Camera Raw, I could use the exact same philosophy we did with that red covered bridge of saying, you know, make it green initially so you can see what you're doing. All the time I start in Camera Raw and I'm going, wow, this photograph is very dark and dramatic, but it'll make my life easier if temporarily I make it easier to see because I know I can always double click on it and change whatever setting I want and click OK and have it update back in Photoshop. So, personally, I the only time I ever turn that little checkbox off is so that when I'm doing demonstrations like this, I can show how to turn it on. Because I always, without ex hardly any exceptions, open from Camera Raw in Photoshop as a smart object because it means I have that ability to go back and forth. Now, and before we talk about where Lightroom fits in the picture, let me address one issue that people have with smart objects and this is an issue that you have to be aware of and that is you have to think of a smart object as this special container where the contents reside somewhere else in this case in camera raw so that means if I I see a bit of sensor dust here if I try and take my let's just use the spot healing brush 
I get this little symbol, which I like to call the I'm sorry, Dave, I can't let you do that symbol, which only works for those of us named Dave. But <laughs> because you can't work directly on the image because it doesn't, it doesn't really exist in Photoshop. So if I try to do it, it says this smart object must be rasterized edit contents will no longer be available. So this is like a horribly evil thing to do. So you never want to click OK, because that would be defeat the whole purpose of it being smart. So instead, yeah, what you have to points. do is take advantage of the fact that most retouching tools, like the healing tools and the clone stamp tool, have an option called sample all layers. So now you add a blank layer, and you use the whatever tool of choice, and now the results are being put onto that blank layer. So that's kind of the one thing that throws people off at first. I'm like, well, how do I edit the file? And the answer is, well, I would personally use tools like the healing brush and the clone stamp this way anyway, because it, to me it's more flexible. So that doesn't, hasn't really changed anything for me, because that's the way I used to do it anyway. Okay? It's so. interesting that that does work because I always feel like, you know, how does that tool reach into the smart object? I think of a smart object as something wrapped up in a in a in a wrapper. Right, and that's that's what is interesting is because it's almost like it's working off the preview or something, uh, and that's what makes it interesting is it's the the one way you can work around the fact that it it is in fact feeling like it's in that protective container, but you can still kind of at least see the information. Uh, the only drawback to this and it is just something to be aware of, is that when I use the spot healing brush there, it's sampled from this current look. Mm -hmm. So if I suddenly decide, oh wait, I want to go back and make it black and white, I'm going to have a bit of a problem because now I'll have colored spots because they don't change. So you oh. can change the smart object, but the healing layer won't change automatically. So you have to kind of be ideally do your workflow to say, okay, now that I know my camera raw file is adjusted the way I'm going to keep it, you know, then I'll do my healing. Now, at worst, of course, you could always throw that layer away and heal again, which would be a bit of a pain if you'd done a whole bunch. But I mentioned that because that's the one thing that tends to throw people off when they try to work on. They're like, but I can't do anything else. Well, you can. You just have to do it on separate layers, which, like I said, I would do anyway. So um, now let's see. I didn't plan this very well. Let me see if I can find this little file that I created. Uh -huh. Maybe not. Is this it? Nope. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll just have to say it verbally. I have a little mm -hmm. diagram that tries to help, but um, in when I'm going from Camera Raw to Photoshop, I just have this little checkbox that says open in Photoshop as a smart object. It's also possible to start in Lightroom and bring it into Photoshop as a smart object. The difference is in Lightroom, and I apologize I didn't plan ahead to have Lightroom running, normally you just choose edit in, but instead you choose open in Photoshop as smart object, so then it effectively looks the same as this icon here with one little twist that throws people off, and that is when you start in Camera Raw, and you double click, it goes back to Camera Raw. When you start in Lightroom and open as a smart object and double click, it goes to Camera Raw. So it doesn't actually create a two-way street between Lightroom and Photoshop. It takes a detour through Camera Raw, but because the engine is the same, you would get the same slider. So if you've never seen Camera Raw before, no problem. It's the same thing. And then once you save the document, as a PSD file, you'll notice in your Light Lightroom catalog, you'll see name of file dash edit dot PSD. So now in my Lightroom catalog, I have this Photoshop editable file with that camera raw smart object kind of built into it. It sounds more complicated than it is. It's just the first time it throws people off because they're almost expecting it to jump back to Lightroom and it doesn't. But effectively, you're still doing the same thing. The reason you'd want to jump back to Lightroom would be to adjust sliders. The only difference is you're adjusting them in Camera Raw, but as you can see, if you're a Lightroom user, these are exactly the same sliders you're used to, so it just has a slightly different interface, but it's the same principle. Yeah, it's the same engine behind it all, it's just right, exactly. different colors. Yeah. So, to me, that's if I don't happen to use Lightroom as my starting tool, but if I did, I'd be very often opening my files into uh, 
Photoshop as a smart object just so I know I have that ongoing ability because I love the option of saying, well, for now, let me make this photo look like this, knowing that I can edit it. And some people ask me, well, why wouldn't you just do that in Photoshop? And I say, because sometimes it's just easier in, in uh, Lightroom or Camera Raw, especially things like clarity. There's no simple way in Photoshop that I've discovered to do the equivalent of clarity. So the fact that there's just a slider that does it, to me, that's yeah, that alone is a good reason to edit Nick it that software. way. <laughs> Sorry? I say they're called plugins. It's called Nick Software. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, when I when I teach, I operate in a plugin free zone just because I remember many years ago I was watching, and I'm talking about many years ago. Um, Jan, you may remember something called Kai's Power Tools. Remember those? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and this guy was doing this really cool tutorial, and like halfway through, he was like, oh, by the way, I'm using this thing called Kai's Power Tools that's $179. And I was like, gosh, uh, I hate when someone's showing something and the solution is a plugin. Now, don't get me wrong. I love plugins like Nick and On One, but when I'm demonstrating things, I like to say, well, here's how I can do it without that extra, you know, add-on. So the point. fact that I can do clarity in effect from within Photoshop um, Oh, which reminds me, let's uh, do this and just grab something. It doesn't really matter. While you're doing that, can I give a little plug? I don't know if everybody knows this, but the G Plus photo editor now includes a lot of the Snapseed features. Did you know that, Ron? Yeah, I know. It's yeah, pretty I cool. I did know that. That's phenomenal. It even does control points now. Yes, what? check it out. Okay, I just unintentionally <laughs> like a whole bunch of files here, but... Okay, so let's say that I was had a file open and was doing some things to it and whatever, I'll just doing anything, duplicate a layer and doing some little transformation thingy. And then I get to all of this point and I think, oh, I wish I had started in camera raw, but I didn't. And now I have layers, so it's too late. Well, not anymore, because as of the last I want to say was introduced late in CS6 and in CC under the filter menu if I convert for smart filters which I always do there's actually this lovely ability now to do camera raw as a filter which to me is outstanding because that means I can take advantage of all the camera raw ability to one specific layer and I absolutely love this because it means now again I can do things that just aren't easy to do otherwise because I mean some of these things would just be much more challenging to do and I had to end up with like five adjustment layers and everything else here I'm just taking advantage of Photoshop or excuse me camera raw settings where I know I can just move sliders around and then click OK and now I have an editable filter that's camera raw on a layer so as much as I like camera raw smart objects back and forth the added ability to say I want to take an individual layer and do camera raw stuff to that, wow, that's tremendous ability to me. One of the best things that quietly kind of came along was like, oh, by the way, you can do this. And I was like, that's not a by the way. That's really cool and very, very useful. Um, which reminds me to say, I kind of touched on it before, but just in case someone is unfamiliar, in the past, before smart filters, and this is one of these things that, that kills me, is the fact that you have to make a deliberate effort to make a filter smart, I think it should just be automatically. So, for example, if I went to a layer, and here's another example, Jan, what you were talking about, where here's what I used to always do. Duplicate the background layer and then apply the filter to this layer because that way if I really made a mistake or hated it, I could at least go back to the original layer. And that's a good theory, but the only problem was it still doesn't tell me how much did I blur that because it's just a layer. So instead, if I take that layer and convert it for smart filters and then do the blur, now when I click OK, it's going to tell me you did a smart filter which was a Gaussian blur. And now I have all these options available to me. I can either just say don't do it at all, turn the eyeball on or off, or, and these should all be and or, double click to find out both what the setting was and to adjust it in some way, and over here on the right hand side there's a little icon which if I double click it opens up something called blending options which looks a whole lot like blend modes and opacity of a layer but it's for the filter so I can do some really interesting effects that I couldn't easily do before for example in this case 
over blurring something and then lowering the opacity to get this wonderful dreamy focus effect that just couldn't do before or as easily or in a way that was editable. And on top of that, in the middle, there's a little mask. So if I decide that maybe on her face, I don't want it to be quite as soft, I could take my paintbrush with a low opacity and just kind of say I want these areas to be a little, have a little more detail in them. And this is another example of that, a simple example, mind you, but a, a good one of that whole reverse engineering thing. If I save this file now and I come back to it later, I can absolutely figure out exactly what I did because I can just look at it and say, well, there's a Gaussian blur. How much? I double click. Okay, it was 59 pixels and I looks like I did something over here. So, okay, 65% and I painted it light gray on the mask. So now I can absolutely look at that and know how I did it. So if I have a similar photo months from now, I can remind myself how I did it. In fact, I could even potentially reuse some of the same effects. So to me, it e shouldn't even be a choice, but it is. So if you're going to apply a filter, I highly recommend that you first convert it to a smart object by using this command called convert for smart filters. That way, it eliminates the need to duplicate the background layer, and it also means that built in, I have all the information I want. And in a similar... Uh, concept, I suppose, to duplicate in the background layer. What people used to do is if they changed their mind, they would delete the copy and get back to the background layer. Effectively, this is the same thing by saying, you know what, let's just delete this smart filter and now I'm back to my original that I started mm -hmm. with. Yeah, I always make every filter, I always make every layer into a smart filter um, accessible layer before I use a filter on it, every time. Yeah, and, and to me, it's, it shouldn't even be a choice. I'm, I'm really mystified as to why, uh, if I, uh, I could honestly have a hard time even trying to think of a time where I just said, oh, I'll just apply a filter without making it smart, because to me, why, why wouldn't you want that ability to have all those options of changing your mind and going back and trying different settings, and you know, you print something, go, oh, it's not quite enough, so you just go back and readjust the smart filter. To me, that's almost one of those no-brainer things where it's in. And, and people say, what's the downside? Well, it, it's probably going to make your file a little bit bigger, but I stopped worrying about file size about in, like, 1980s, 1997. <laughs> when when the know. cost of RAM went below a dollar. Exactly, a megabyte. where storage got cheap like it is today. <laughs> I mean, you know, I have thumb drives rattling around the bottom of my briefcase that are bigger than my original hard drive was when I first on my first computer. So storage shouldn't be a reason for not, you know, for worrying about file size. Now, if it's your computer is grinding to a halt because your name's Bert Monroy and you're creating a 4,000 layered, you know, work of art, that's a little bit different. But for the most mortals among us, uh, having a lot of layers with smart objects, okay, yes, it's going to be a bigger file, but usually, in, in my experience, not to the point where it's going to cause you trouble, especially for all the advantages that it gives you. Well, this is just, oh, I want to say, by the way, that's a gorgeous photo. Did oh, thank you. I, I wanted to prove the fact that not everything I do involves Photoshop, so I decided to take some photos that were just an effort to be right out of the camera looking that way. And I also did take some of her specifically to do things in Photoshop. And that's kind of my style of photography is that I use something that I call Photoshop photography where I, things like this, where I take a photograph with the intention of turning it into something so that, you know, I, in this case, took multiple photos on a tripod so that I could create this, and I went in with that plan in mind. And then other times I decide I just want to try and make a nice photo like this one. Great. Cool. Well, before I forget, I do want to mention this because this is my favorite expression. These are the, the nasty, horrible things we should try to avoid in Photoshop. We call them the five forbidden fruits. Merge, erase, flatten, delete, rasterize. All of those are bad things which will cause you harm. <laughs> and should be avoided at all cost. <laughs> we have to tell Trey Ratcliffe that because I see him merging a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I've dis discovered is most of us are creatures of habit, and if you've got in the habit of merging, you'll keep doing it until one day it comes back and bites you when you realize you've lost the ability <clears throat> excuse me, to edit something that you want to edit. So mm -hmm. to me, I just want to avoid that issue completely <laughs> by finding ways to to use methods that aren't going to cause me any trouble. 
Well, I have to say, um, we, we, we burnt through an hour really quickly. That's that's incredible. And I know there's a lot of people that are saying they, they've really learned a lot of new things, even though it, it at first seems like, oh, yeah, I understand smart objects. Yeah, I you know, you've given us a new understanding of why it's really important. And the why is the important part. Right. Uh, it's not enough just to know kind of what it does. And it still is even kind of. It's really important to know why it's important in your workflow. Mm-hmm. So yeah, thanks a lot for sharing that with us. Oh, my, my pleasure. And, and like I said, I could probably go on another hour and <laughs> or two. But um, I think what I always tell people is is that there's a lot of things you can do in Photoshop, obviously in a lot of different ways. But anytime you are comparing two methods and one gives you a chance to experiment and or reuse and repurpose and edit, and the other doesn't, then I, without even thinking, I'd always default to the one that's like. Even if it takes you an extra step, for example, to make it a smart filter, why wouldn't you because of all the options that it gives you? And if you're in a dialog box you've never seen before, if it's got a cancel button and a preview button, I call those permission to experiment because you haven't done anything yet. So why not try some new settings and see what it does? And if you don't like it, you can always undo. Very good. But I think one of the challenges, we're creatures of habit, so we do things the way we always have, and it's a lot harder to give yourself permission to try some of these new methods. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Really wonderful. Um, as usual, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I always do from you different ways to think of things. And you know, if you ever want to come back, please let us know. We'd love to have you again because you're sure. so. You're, I can tell you're like me. You just have so much that you want to show people and tell people, right? It's just like bursting out of well, you. You know, and, I never thought, and, and if you asked me this years ago, I never would have thought that if someone said you have an hour, I would have been like, well, only an hour? You know, <laughs> and that's what's like. How on earth will I fill that? Now it's like, you sure I can't have two hours? How about five days? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to teach at a uh, a small school up in uh, South Carolina for photographers, which is actually four and a half day or three and a half days, which is going to be a real joy because normally I don't get that opportunity to work with a small group for multiple days like that. So that's very cool. It is cool, but you know what I found out about it? You, ha I had to back off. Like, you know, in the afternoons, I had to let them go out and shoot or something because their brains <laughs> were exploding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Saturation. I mean, you, there's just so much you can put in at one time. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cool, but I think we're, oh my gosh, we definitely are beyond our hour. We try to keep it to an hour so people can watch the whole thing in one sitting. Um, so thank you again. And Dave, Bell, thank you for being there as always. Always and perfect. Ron, your wonderful co-host, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I just love being here. Yeah. Um, what I was just going to mention before we leave is in um, uh, for the rest of the summer, we've, we've been kind of slowed down on the schedule a little bit because of extreme busyness and family matters. And our next guest is scheduled now for uh, one month away, uh, Julia Kuzmenko Kim, who's a, a phenomenal uh, fashion retouch artist, model, and photographer. And uh, she runs Retouching Academy uh, site on Facebook and she's um, uh, along with um, Michael and I won't even dare try to pronounce his last name who lives here in Toronto is, is just a, a world-class retoucher and they're going to be our guests and they're going to talk about some fantastic things great techniques that have been getting thrown around like uh, uh, the right way to do dodging and burning and something called frequency separation and, and talk about the whole uh, concept of you know is there too much in Photoshop can you take it too far so I'm looking forward to that in a month from now but there's a really good possibility in two weeks we're gonna be somewhere on a beach so <laughs> oh, lovely. Well, enjoy if you are so, all right yeah. everybody, well, everybody go home and practice some of those great things that Dave showed us and have a wonderful next month we may see you before that you never know here on the Photoshop show. bye thank you